Hello, today I come to you sad and angry. And the reason why is that even though this event happened a couple weeks ago, I just found out yesterday that Aaron Schwartz committed suicide. Schwartz was a young man, a young intellectual, who believed it to be so important that we have the capacity to exchange ideas, to exchange intellectual capital with anyone of any race, religion, creed, belief, or socioeconomic status across the world, and that when he saw legislation being passed to try to limit the transference of ideas among all people in this world that he passionately fought to retain these ideals so that we could continue to exchange ideas and intellectual capital with one another no matter what our socioeconomic status no matter what our religion and no matter what our beliefs and ultimately this belief cost him his own life now if you don't know who Aaron Aaron Schwartz was he was the co-founder of reddit he founded an advocacy group that fought against tyrannical legislation such as SOPA and PIPA and this organization that he founded was called Demand Progress and ultimately it was this fight that probably cost him his life. Now here are a couple quotes from Aaron Schwartz about why he hated SOPA so much. He said quote unquote there's a battle going on right now a battle to define everything that happens on the internet in terms of traditional things that the law understands. Under SOPA, new technology, instead of bringing us greater freedom, would have snuffed out fundamental rights we'd always taken for granted. And even after he was successful in the movement to defeat SOPA, he added in a consequence speech, quote unquote, and it will happen again. Sure, it will have another name and maybe a different excuse and probably do its damage in a different way. But make no mistake, the enemies of the freedom to connect have not disappeared. The fire in those politicians' eyes have not been put out. There are a lot of people, a lot of powerful people who want to clamp down on the internet. Now, I believe it was because of these beliefs that those in power, primarily the bankers and the bankster-run governments, found Aaron Schwartz's views to be a threat that had to be snuffed out. So, they sent one of their pit bulls after him, a U.S. attorney from Massachusetts, Carmen Ortiz, that has no business practicing as an attorney because she threatened Aaron Schwartz with 35 years in jail and up to a million dollars in, in fines. And I believe that it was a threat. And at one point, the threats were escalated from, I think it was four counts to up to 13 counts. And up to 50 years in jail, which would effectively been the rest of Aaron Schwartz's life. So I believe it was the belief on Aaron Schwartz's part that he could spend the rest of his life in jail. And he probably understood how the machine works. So he probably believed that it was a strong possibility that ultimately caused him to commit suicide. So what was Aaron Schwartz prosecuted for? 
he was basically prosecuted for hacking into um, a, an online repository of articles of intellectual property that was called JSTOR. Now, according to Wikipedia, JSTOR is a digital repository that archives content from journal articles, manuscripts, GIS systems, and scanned plant specimens and disseminates it online. Now, Aaron Schwartz had a problem with JSTOR because JSTOR compensated the publishers and not the authors of this digital repository, which he felt was wrong. And also he felt that it was basically wrong to charge people to access information that he felt should be free to everyone. So what he did was he hacked into the system and he downloaded a good part of this digital repository and that's when he was arrested with the intent uh, and he was charged with the intent to disseminate this information for free. So the interesting part of the story was that his lawyer said, unfortunately, two days before Aaron Schwartz committed suicide, that he had actually negotiated a deal where he, Aaron Schwartz would not have to spend 35 years in prison or 50 years in prison, but it's a joke that Carmen Ortiz, U.S. Attorney Carmen Ortiz, was even speaking in these terms because you have banks committing far more despicable, deplorable acts that get off scot-free. And here's Carmen Ortiz, her justification. She said, stealing is stealing. It doesn't matter if it's performed by a computer command or a crowbar. So she was going to go after Aaron Schwartz with everything she could. And that is a joke. It's a complete joke. Because banks every day get away with theft. If you think about inflation, people don't in, in understand inflation. But let me break it down for everyone out there that still does not understand that the central bank in every country in the world is stealing from every citizen in this world through a theft called inflation. Others have been kinder and given it a more uh, appeasing term, like a silent tax. But in reality, inflation is nothing nothing less than theft and should be considered from a moral standpoint of nothing less than theft. So here's how inflation works. If the dollar loses 50% of its purchasing power, which happened approximately between 2000 and 2008, it lost about 50% of its purchasing power. Now, that means if you had a million dollars in 2000 and just kept that in a bank in the form of savings, since it's lost 50% of its purchasing powers, whatever basket of goods you could have bought with that million dollars would now require $2 million just 8 to 10 years later. Or another way of looking at it is that because you kept that million dollars in a bank, in a savings account, just for 8 to 10 years, that amount had been reduced to $500,000. And there is nothing you could do about it. So that is the exact same because fiat currency, the central bankers choose to deliberately devalue it to try to take away people's ability to oppose their system of tyranny and to revolt by constantly degrading everyone's wealth that is theft. Now think about a money or an alternate form of money like physical gold and physical silver that retains its purchasing power. And if it increases in purchasing power versus all fiat currencies, versus the yen, versus the yuan, versus the British pound sterling, versus the US dollar, versus the Canadian dollar, versus the euro. So not even taking into consideration that the physical silver and physical gold since 2001 has increased in purchasing power. Just say it maintained its same purchasing power. If you had a million dollars worth of gold in 2000, even though 
today, since gold has risen more than 700%, I believe it is, that million would now be worth $8 million. Just say, for the sake of making a clear argument, that you had 10 bars of gold worth a million dollars. Now, someone came into your home, pointed a gun at your head, and said, I'm going to blow your damn brains out unless you give me five bars of your gold worth $500,000. And the finger is on the trigger. You have two seconds to decide before I pull that trigger or hand over five bars of gold to me. That act is no different than inflation, except you have a choice. You have a choice to fight and possibly die to keep your money or hand over your money and live. Now, with inflation, what central bankers do, which is despicable, immoral, it should be illegal, it's definitely unjust, it's cowardly, it's a silent form of theft. They, they take your money because your purchasing power has been degraded, been cut in half. If you own the U.S. dollar from 2000 to some point around 2008, 2009, the U.S. dollar's purchasing power have been cut in half by 50% against a basket of all other currencies. So, that example is exactly the same as someone coming into your home, holding a gun to your head, and the only difference is, in that example, you have a choice. Where in this, you don't even have a choice, so it's more despic despicable than someone even breaking into your home and putting a gun at your temple and demanding half your money. It's more despicable because you don't even have a choice, and it's theft. So the fact that Carmen Ortiz would say theft is theft is a joke because none of these U.S. attorneys go after any of these banks for what they do. Any of this theft. You have U.S. Federal Reserve branches in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco, St. Louis, Atlanta. Can't remember all 12 sites. But U.S. Attorney Generals, do any of those Attorney Generals in any of those states go after the Federal Reserve branches in these counties for theft. Every state in the United States has banks that participate in this theft. And do they go after any of these banks? For part two of this video, click here.